All right, hello. Uh, thank you for being here uh, and for staying awake after two presentations. Uh, so I'm the only one standing between you and the next coffee break. Um, I've just uh, calculated that I've been an open source contributor for 23 years by now, almost daily. But this is not what I will be talking about. So I will be talking about uh, the mainframe, and in particular the the facts uh, or that that ecosystem exists. I will explain what it is. I will explain a few things about it, and why is this? Uh, uh, why is the health of this ecosystem has been on the decline? And then why everything is sort of going very well, but people are running away. So my intention is to give you information which you do not know. So if you, uh, if I'm start saying things that you already know, then uh, start start rattling your your uh, badge. You will not disturb other people because the, the things rattle all the time anyway. But you know, I will get some some feedback that they need to just keep a slide. Right. So um, this is a mainframe. It's th this is approximately I don't know like two meters, two and a half, uh, two and a half meters uh, uh, high. You probably do not because this is a Z14. This is a very new mainframe. It has come out uh, very uh, very recently. So uh, this is a picture from uh, IBM website with a corporate uh, uh, attribution. So uh, what it is, it's basically a very, very big computer. It's a computer that's been meant to process uh, transactions and on immense, uh, in immense uh, quantities and in, with immense speed. Whenever you're using your uh, credit card or debit card, there's probably some code in COBOL or some other languages, which I will show some examples of, that is running on the mainframe. If you are booking your tickets somewhere, if uh, I know some company is calculating your insurance uh, percentage or your uh, salary, it probably happens on the mainframe. So uh, uh, yeah, IBM also on their website said that uh, three of, 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 of four uh, uh, companies in the Fortune 500, you know, the, the, the biggest and the, the fattest and the, the richest, uh, they use uh, uh, mainframes, and uh, uh, that's true. But also, for instance, if you take the um, uh, if you take the transactions the, themselves, then something like ninety percent of all the transactions they happen in in Cobol on uh, the mainframe. So um, this is approximately how, in one slide, the ecosystem looks like. So they divide their languages. Uh, in uh, in terms of generations, so they have first generation language, which is code, the like zeros and ones and stuff like this. You never program this yourself, but this is sort of thing that the, the metal part is executing. Then you have a second generation language, which is assembler. Third generation, which is uh, COBOL or Java or whatever, what, what have you. You yes, you can run Java on the, on the mainframe, obviously. And then you have fourth generation languages. So I'll have I'll have some examples. Uh, very soon. So, um, in uh, uh, general, uh, people uh, who are unaware of uh, mainframe, yes, I know you're, you're aware of it. Uh, people who are completely unaware of mainframe, they, they usually say, yeah, well, but if there's still like a little bit of cobble somewhere, why don't you just, you know, migrate? So, there, there are several things that stop the, 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 you know, the simply part. You can migrate, and we do that, uh, but, uh, yeah, so just replacing the compiler, is a bit uh, is a bit hard because it doesn't take the whole ecosystem into account. A typical project that runs on mainframe uses like five different languages and several databases and transaction managers and all kinds of stuff that is is sort of working in, in as one happy family in one uh, ecosystem and it all works. It's 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 fine. It's good. People learn to live with it. They define their macros. The the developer so they click on a button and something uh, happens. That's Totally bizarre for uh, you know run-of-the-mill Java programmers, but you know if if you click on a button and it works, then you know you're you're not experiencing a lot of pain from it. Uh, so if you try to take one of the components uh, out of the thing, the entire Jenga tower of uh, of this ecosystem sort of collapses. So you need to think about quite a lot of things when you're uh, when you're migrating. Just rewriting the thing uh, also doesn't really work. 
Because you know, a typical system uh, of a typical bank is somewhere between 100 or 200 million lines of code just in COBOL. Then they have between I don't know, 20 and 100, I would say, million lines of code in something like PL1. And then they have some four generation languages, scripting languages, job control languages, and, and, and whatnot. And it is, it is quite substantial. So it will probably take less time to redevelop from scratch now because we have all these fancy programmers and programming books and technologies and everything but uh, in order to put it in production you will need to compare it with the system that was already running and you know the, what, what happens with people who have the money and who have an old system that makes them more money every millisecond they are very uh, very reluctant in stopping everything throwing it out of the window and starting really to redevelop it from, from scratch so just dropping it is also sort of not an option because it's an expensive uh, uh, system uh, but it does happen, so in, in some cases the migration is, okay, let's de declare bankruptcy, uh, close the shop and, and you know, do something else with our lives, like open source. Um, you can just leave it for a while, and for quite a while it's uh, uh, sort of possible, but people who know this stuff, they get harder and harder to come by. So by leaving it, you do not... Um, uh, you do not solve the problem, you sort of postpone it. And if you will retire in two or three years, that is a viable strategy for you personally, to survive just before you go on, on, uh, on, uh, on a break. Uh, or just wrap it in something and then use, I don't know, handwritten, well-designed Java to call the, the, the old thing. That's sort of possible, but that's what uh, people in uh, software engineering call technical debt. So technical debt means that you're sort of you're making a compromise which makes your life today easier, but tomorrow you will have to pay it back and you have some interests that you're paying back. Right, so I was talking about the generation of languages, so let's take it generation by generation. I will not show you the first generation, it's literally zeros and ones, nothing nothing more interesting than that. So the second generation uh, language is uh, uh, only one there. It's called High Level uh, Assembler. It exists since 1964. It was called Basic Assembler Language. And the last release was actually in 2013, so it's, uh, it's uh, alive and kicking. It's good for uh, many things, uh, in particular for uh, like error handling that well all the things that you would use a normal assembler for right if you want to, things to go fast if you want things to be um, you know something to, to do something which is not always expected from uh, from a normal application and for instance if you want to uh, let several systems interoperate which worked which were compiled with different compilers for instance then you do uh, stuff with assembly but sometimes some reasons are just well we were writing it in 1971 and we didn't have time we didn't have money back then to pay for a cobalt compiler so we just wrote it in assembler and we sort of didn't touch that code since 1971 right we, we, it, and it is in production, right? So again, every time you use your credit cards, that code is run. So you also wouldn't want that to be replaced with a Java one-liner. It probably is replaceable with a one-liner, but that one-liner will have to be tested for like a couple of years before you, uh, before you replace it. Because if it hasn't been replaced since 1971, there must be a reason for it. All right, and yeah, well, tailoring of products is so sometimes some some of the products have their API exposed only as uh, uh, assembler markers. So uh, again, when you're programming in in assembler, there is no code and no data. There's bytes, and so it means that you can do wonderful things like self modification. So it's when you, you you write your program, but what you execute is not your program, but your program modifies itself before executing itself or it executes itself and then it modifies it, it's the part that has already been executed and it goes there and it executes it uh, again. It's, it's extremely hard to, uh, to detect, it's extremely hard to um, understand what's going on in, in the system. People who wrote it were very smart, they also felt very smart for, uh, for doing that because it, it saved them a byte here and a byte there and back then it sort of mattered. Uh, now it sort of doesn't, I mean, th again, this system operates in like petabytes of data right now, and it's, it's very, everything is, is extremely fun. 
the instructions names they, they have names approximately uh, like this and when, once once you are sort of experienced assembler programmer then you understand that oh it's it's uh, it's addition and g means that it's 64 bits and then uh, uh, h is half word and then it's immediate so I put in the immediate so the data that I'm putting in the thing is used in the immediate and k means that I'm dealing with three parameters instead of two. And, but again, you know, if, if you're working with these things, it sort of have has has probably some impact on your on your health as well. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's my assumption, but it's uh, on, at the late, later slide I will have a pointer to the paper that we recently published about whether programming languages can have uh, can be harmful for your mental uh, health. <laughs> So they, they also have an instruction name, which name is actually readable, it's called execute, which is not an acronym, it's just execute. But it basically means that, oh, you know, take those bytes from memory and kind of apply a mask to them and just execute them on the fly. So it, it, the presence of this thing means that you cannot just, you know, translate it to a different language automatically or have a simple compiler that just takes things one by one and compiles them to something. No, this means that you need to be prepared for literally anything. So any byte from anywhere could be taken and say, well, just execute. Let's pretend this is code. And this is quite hard to do. And then they have semi-structured uh, system macros with, uh, you know, if and go. So, you know, you, you go, you've probably heard of go to. So this is a go to. And this is like, oh, yes, we can have a go, which actually sends into things. Usually you have some cryptic branch instructions that checks some magic uh, flag that is set somewhere and then uh, transfers. And you have structured macros, but they are almost never occurring in practice, at least in our practice, because they are a paid thing, so you need to, uh, to pay extra money to be able to use these macros. Wonderful. So let's move to a third generation language. So who, know, who knows that person? Oh, It's Grace Maria Hoffman, of course, yes. One of the, one of the years of, uh, of software engineering. Yes. So COBOL exists since uh, since 1959, and uh, it is designed by a committee, and it has been uh, upgraded by by a committee multiple times since then. Uh, but it's basically based on two of uh, her ideas. First of all, did I put? Oh yeah. Uh, so there are two ideas that were crucial in the development of software languages in general. First of all, that it should we should program in a near natural language. So before her, the languages were of two kinds. You either were drawing boxes and then uh, putting arrows between them and writing formulas. Uh, and it doesn't matter that you couldn't put these boxes into the computer because the compilation was on you. So you would write the boxes and then you would take a, a white piece of paper, a pencil, and then you would compile it, compile it sort of, and then you would put the, the, the codes on the, on the piece of paper and then you would punch them into a punch card and that goes into the computer. Yeah. And uh, she said, no, well, you know, why, why don't we just use, you know, words of English? And the second idea, also groundbreaking at the time, was that let's make compilation automatic. Uh, it, it's sort of very tedious to translate the words into codes, and it's very error-prone where a human is doing. But don't we have a thing lying around which is actually good with doing tedious things and not making errors with it? It's called a computer, a digital computer at the moment because the computer was a name for the, the uh, profession for people who were computing things. Um, so yeah, based on these two things, COBOL was, uh, was formed, and it has a lot of things. For example, uh, no other language, well, no other, not COBOL-like language has a picture clause, which is a, a wonderful thing. It's when you say, oh, you know, my, my data is my data, but this is, this is sort of the representation that they want to, to, to do. I don't know. If you're dealing with dates, for instance, then you say, well, two things for day, then a dot, then two things for the uh, month, then dots, then th uh, four things for, or two, if you are, uh, we're not anticipating the year 2000 at the moment. But let's say four for the uh, for the year, and then you would just store uh, you know this four digit. It was it's eight digits. I'm not good with numbers. The eight digits somewhere. But every time you would print them, for instance, they would put it the two of them, and then dots two of them, and then dot. Um, and then it had 47 statements uh, of different kind, and they were all called uh, verbs. So in in COBOL, for instance, you would have a verb called copy, which was basically a legalized uh, uh, cloning or copy-pasting. 
it would say, okay, take take that file and let's pretend it's here. It's sort of like one, what an include does in C, for instance. But it could also do copy replacing, and it would say, oh, copy replacing uh, Tom by Kim. And then it, it would import uh, a file and it would find lexically all the occurrence of uh, uh, T or M and it would replace them with uh, K, I, M. With, uh, you know, the rest of the semantics is preserved. <laughs> Then you also, you, you have heard of GoTo, because there, is, there was a famous uh, article by Edsger Dijkstra, GoTo considered harmful. So how about GoTo depending, when you say go to this, 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 and this place, depending on this variable, and that variable with just a number of, so it's three, then you go to the third label that you, uh, that you mentioned. And it sort of happens on the fly, it's very hard to emulate in, in, in other languages. And hard to think about, again, when you're maintaining somebody's uh, code. Perform through. So perform is basically you, you, uh, you have a label somewhere and you say, well, just do this. So it's basically a method invocation. But perform through basically means look at the place in the program where that method is located and find another method. So you give it two names and find all the methods that are between these two in the text of the program and just keep executing them one by one. If some of them exit, then don't mind, just go ahead and execute it anyway. Right? This never happens in any other languages except for assembler probably. And this is very dangerous because you don't know if any piece of code uses your code with perform through and if it does then you can you may never move your code around because if you move your code around you you scrub the entire then you have move corresponding. It's a, it's an uh, assignment, but it's name-based assignment. So you you have two data structures, but that one has first name, last name, and account uh, number, and that one has first name, last name, and account number. And then you you map these three uh, with some you know changes in uh, in uh, data types, for instance. And the next sentence, so it, usually in, uh, in languages you have statements, and statements is basically a sentence, and then you go one by one. So in COBOL, sometimes you, you have the option of not putting the dot, not ending a sentence at the end of your statement. And then once you say next sentence, you basically go to, to the next place where there is literally a dot in your program. So just imagine being a programmer and working on somebody else's codes that, for instance, has not been changed since 1971. Right? And then you, you read the, the code and then it says next sentence and then you're looking for actually really a dot. You're looking for a dot, where, where is it? And then at some point you find it, and, ah, you want it to go here. Right? This is, so looking for a dot in your inner code is, is, is insanely uh, strange and bizarre activity, which also doesn't reflect very good on your health. So a fourth generation language, so this, uh, well, by the way, in, in, the, um, in the corner, so for assembler, I've uh, done the um, uh, screenshot of the assembler compiler that we have uh, uh, written, and this is also an app builder compiler that we have also written to help people migrate from these things and at least have, you know, uh, you recognize this is, this is like Windows. With, with, which, with a Visual Studio, so you have like colors and you can control click on things and see the dependencies and if you want to know if somebody is calling your things and you, you, you analyze the dependencies and if you want to debug you put the breakpoint there and you just go step by step and you can do that in our system with like multiple languages and uh, step from your favorite 4GL into COBOL into a server into anything. So this app builder is one of the fourth generation uh, languages. It exists since 1992, relatively young. It can compile itself to COBOL and uh, C and Java. And uh, syntax is a bit reminiscent of uh, COBOL, but it has things like, uh, you know, in, in, in good cases, you would have this as a domain-specific language. So it would represent the concepts in a domain. In this case, this is a sort of a badly designed DSL. So it has things that are called sets. But they're not sets, they're lookup tables. They have things that are called views, and they are using the a model view controller uh, uh, pattern, and they are actually models, they're not views in the they just called views. They have rules, but they're not declarative, uh, even though they're called rules. And you have methods that, uh, for instance, a set encoding, it's a getter, it's not a setter. But uh, set visible, that's a setter. 
So set encoding is a getter because it's, a, it's an encoding of a set because you have a thing called a set. <laughs> And it, it, it took me quite a while to, in, it, I was not able, for legal reasons, to read the documentation of this language. So all these things I learned by heart and by, by uh, talking to people who have uh, experience with this, who will be retiring next year, so we needed to work hard to extract the information. So. And uh, so in other languages, when you, have, when you have a name for something, that name is unique. In this language, they said, oh, unique names, that's so uh, mainstream. So for instance, this is a valid statement in that language. You just say, map A in A to A. And because it's an in, it knows that uh, this A is a set, this A is an element of a set, and this A is, uh, is a field. Easy. Right, so this is an example of... Um, of an app builder a statement. So if this is a switch case uh, uh, or ca uh, case or you know whatever whatever you are used to in your language. So this is the startup case, this is the end, and then they have a few things. And first you look at it and think, well, perfect. It's you compare x to a and b. You compare it to c and d. If this fits, then you execute foo. If this fits, you execute bar. One of the things that you see here, is there is no um, there, there are no um, semicolons. Right? So. Uh, Nothing indicates where one thing starts and another one ends. So if B is a value, then B is a part of the condition and everything works as we first anticipated. If B is a void procedure, so it's a callable thing, then actually it sort of belongs here. So it's, uh, uh, we compare X to A and then we execute B as a uh, procedure. But if B is a procedure that returns something, then it's also a part of the condition. So we call it, we compare it to X, and only then we execute foo. But if it's a procedure which return value cannot be uh, uh, converted, then we treat it as a void procedure, and it, then it's just a part of the approach. And this is an example of something that is extremely confusing for a compiler writer, but is equally confusing, or even more so, for, uh, for a programmer that's maintaining uh, the code and working uh, with the code. So, of course, there is much more uh, to this. There's, there are database queries, there are database management systems, there are, uh, there are transaction managers, scripting languages, and so forth. And all these things, again, have been in each of these systems for decades, which means at some point people ran into limitations of this and they started um, uh, they started extending them in their own way, right? So you also have something that, I don't know, somewhere in 1980s, somebody was not happy with this and made an extension and retired happily 10 years after that. And even more, even 10 years, more or 20, then you're there and you're looking at this extension and you're wondering how can you migrate it somewhere. So the knowledge of the system is sort of somewhere and everybody's pointing at, uh, at each other. So, for instance, the very simple question that we ask in, when we do consulting for these uh, companies is what languages are in use? What, what, what do you do? And usually they're like, yeah, well, we just have COBOL. And they're like, oh, thanks, God, that's, that's it's very easy. Our COBOL compiler is even for free. You know, just download it and, you know, if you ever need support, call us, but, you know, just you know, try to use it. And then we, we go further and it's like, yeah, well, we also have sort of a little bit of PL1, but it's, it's a little bit, it's a couple of million lines of code. But, uh, <laughs> And then we, we search further and say, yeah, well, we have a very little bit of assembly, but we have like millions and millions of, uh, of COBOL and PLR, but assembly is just 1,000 lines. Yes, but somebody needs to run these 1,000 lines if you migrate somewhere. And we, we actually have several lines of C list. And even people who work with like mainframe, they, they have sometimes have never heard of C list. But it, it's sort of a language, it was legit in, 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 in the time. And at some point, uh, this comes from a real uh, case when I was analyzing a uh, portfolio. And uh, I found this one particular uh, file that was uh, like a one-liner or two-liner with C list. And it had a comment also like, yeah, well, uh, sure, I could write it in COBOL as well. But I mean, in C list, it's a one-liner. So I'm just uh, putting it. Uh, and it was a file modified in 1992. And it has not been modified ever since. And uh, it was all working. But I mean. Even the presence of one line of something that you cannot run on a new system will result in a, in a failure to, to my file. So which file is which? Is which in, uh, in the analysis of GitHub that you do nowadays, you look at the extension, right? 
good for you to have the extension. Right? Sometimes you don't have the extension, and uh, you, you, usually they can like, okay, this is we're sharing like the, the our best data with you. This is our data, and you see there like a million files without any extensions in one directory in flat structure. It's like this is everything that we have. And what calls what, and if some if some of these what uh, is is it all in use or uh, you know some of these are, are these all correct? This is this is all unknown, and luckily we uh, you know we, we can do some you know an automated analysis to uh, to find this. Uh, so the uh, there are also problems with like MIPS. So MIPS is you know how much of the computation basically you consume. So in the past, when you had uh, when you had MIPS and you had this, right? The, if you if you're a bank and s somehow for the next month you have like twice as much consumption of a calculation on your server than in this month, it's good. It means twice as many people were using your your stuff, and the more people use your your stuff, the more money you earn. You're a bank. Yeah? But nowadays, what happens is. Uh, uh, you have more transactions because you've released a mobile app and people have been clicking around. People were just bored and they were clicking around. Uh, there, was a, there was a big case that happened with a company. I tried to Google that but I didn't find it so I will not say the name of the company because probably it's classified information. But it's a very big logistic company that delivers uh, stuff. And they, uh, they did, uh, uh, had a mobile... Hmm? I didn't say that. Uh, there was there was a uh, mobile app where you could see what is the status of your delivery, and people were you know you're expecting the delivery so you're refreshing, right? You're refreshing and your package is not there so you refresh again and again and again and they had basically like an explosion of, of a number of uh, transactions. So what they've done, what you usually do in computer science, you cache the value. So it has been if it has been refreshed, uh, I know uh, within the last ten minutes, you just use the cached values. And then people started noticing. Then you know, I keep refreshing. It says not delivered, but here's the package. Yeah. And they're like, "What the hell are you doing? This is uh, yeah." So you know, you know, you 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 choose between paying insane amount of money for uh, servicing people who are just bored and clicking around in your app, uh, or you can choose for a slightly technically advanced solution, which makes people unhappy. Both are sort of bad. Uh, so the, uh, the, there is a people problem, so the uh, 4GLs are pretty much unknown to anyone, which means it takes time to, to educate people for this, which means you're paying more money to stay in this uh, platform, which is also sort of uh, bad. Uh, it's, it's also sort of un uncool, or at least it's, it's seen as uncool. If you're trained as a COBOL programmer, you can actually earn a lot of money. Uh, if you learn some 4GL, you can earn even more money, but in a more limited number of companies. Because usually, it's uh, uh, every 4GL has just se several hundred companies that, that uh, do that. And the existing experts are sort of retiring and going away. And everything is just very slow. You know, you want to start a new project, you need ten more people. You need to hire ten more people. Or hopefully more, you need to educate them in that particular thing and it's all going very, very slow. And existing people, again, they are on the brink of retirement. They are not very fast in working, not only because they are old, but because they are the concentrated uh, knowledge about the, the, your, your system. So everybody, I've seen these people work in, in real life, they get interrupted uh, two, three times an hour by somebody walking uh, by and saying, well, you know, I've been on this on this thing for two days, I couldn't solve it, and they quickly go and uh, they are this, 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 and they solve it quickly, but it interrupts their flow, so they, uh, they are also not extremely productive in, in uh, other places. So if you want concrete cases, go to raincode.com, we have, uh, you know, we worked with Volvo, we worked with uh, uh, some big banks in, uh, in Poland, some uh, insurance uh, or governmental uh, company uh, institution in, in uh, uh, Czechia and some some uh, other places, and you know yet you know for instance IBM well somebody who is sort of semi affiliated but not quite with IBM they published this, uh, this paper that IBM is uh, you know since the release of the new mainframe they uh, uh, they are back again and they are they're earning more than ever. 
part of it is because it's a new mainframe and everybody wants to migrate from the old mainframe to the new and the new one is probably more expensive than the previous one and of course you're selling more more expensive stuff to, you, to people so of course you're earning money but still you know it works so mainframes are fine as a thing they are very reliable they're very solid very mature a lot of companies are still staying there but there is a lot of there are a lot of things that make people uncomfortable make people want to migrate away from them and there is a lot of tech that I've shown you that may have some impact on your mind if you work with it uh, too much, but it's also seen as unconventional. So maybe it's just solvable by education, by, by telling more people about this, maybe at, just at university courses, that it becomes <coughs> less unconventional and then everything is fine. And yeah, that's the thing with can some programming languages be considered harmful? Thank you.